always come back to games I came to with my dad here. The 2002 America East Championship. And then it's the next year, the championship coming back here was Boston University was playing Vermont. That is some pops. Warriors leading score, now they try the alley -oop. I remember Scotty Jones catching the alley-oop that Jermaine Mopajila threw from half court and dunking it over Paul Seymour. I remember Ryan Butt's shot from like 26 feet out and the place going crazy. It felt like the roof was going to blow off. And I remember that 2003 championship game wound up being the last game I ever attended with my dad, which I didn't realize it at the time. You know, I've been coming to games here for 13 years since he died. Really, it was after taking that year off after not doing One Bid Wonders, I felt like I needed to kind of, uh, I needed to make peace with everything again. It always feels very different to be in here without him. But I still like coming here because I still feel closer to him here. I was born and raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, very unique and great city to grow up in. It's a lot different than a lot of people think. You know, I guess they know it for being the hometown of Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and a host of other people. But um, you know, when I was there, there were plenty of haves and also plenty of have-nots. Like there's a lot of public housing. I went to school with kids that were really rich who lived in West Cambridge million dollar houses. I grew up with kids who lived in the projects and uh, were on, you know, food stamps and subsidized housing and all that stuff and everything in between. I was a really, really, really nervous little kid. I had a lot of anxiety. Um, and I was, and my anxiety was related that something was going to happen to like my parents, but especially him. I don't know why. Um, and like I'd want to like go to the store with him when he was going there. Like I'd be able to like do something if he was in trouble, which made no sense because I was a little tiny kid, um, and he was this massive athletic guy. Um, and I'd always look for him to like reassure me that like everything was going to be okay, and he was always going to be there. And he wouldn't do that. He said, you know, there's going to come a time. The way that this works is that I'm not always going to be around. You know, the way it's supposed to work is that I die before you do. But. I'm always, a part of me is always going to be there with you. Um, he called me big guy all the time, which was really uh, funny and unique because I didn't get his height. I'm like 5'8 and a little bit on a good day. He was a really good dad. He, he would always, uh, you know, take us to the park, play, play basketball. He was my basketball coach, taught us baseball, took us to games. He had been a basketball player. He played, he played baseball and football in high school. He played basketball into college. I grew up watching him as a kid still playing in summer leagues with, you know, college players and, you know, he was watching him dunk into his mid-50s and I, I just thought that was the norm. I thought anybody could dunk, you know, I didn't realize until much later on that, uh, you know, that was really something pretty incredible. I think, you know, he wanted to be a writer, but he ended up working for the Department of Transportation. It's like things like that, you know, you don't want to be in the cubicle, like we are talking about, like, he had to spend a lot of time in like that setting, and that just wasn't him. He was like a guy who was a he was a basketball player. He was like a you know ferocious reader. I think he was at peace with not being a professional basketball player, but I know that he would have rather done something else for work. Like he wasn't inspired by his work. It gave him a good paycheck, good benefits as a government job. But uh, it wasn't what he wanted to do. He didn't particularly enjoy it a lot of the time. <laughs> um, and I know he had this plan for a while that when he retired, he w he wanted to try and become like a history teacher in like a middle school somewhere uh, when he was at a point where he could retire. From very early age, my dad introduced me to sports. As a kid, from my really earliest memories, my dad started taking me and then my younger brother to UMass basketball games. We would go every year to a bunch of games 
It was a really fun experience. We'd hop in a car, we'd drive out to the Mullen Center out in Amherst, but he would like explain the game to me. He'd tell me about the different players. He'd tell me about their backgrounds. He'd tell me about um, kind of the narrative and and just it was really, it was a really great experience to get to be around him and my brother um, and to feel like it was uh, an adventure to be going to these games. That was how I became a fan. So by the time I got to high school, you know, life, you, you want to become independent when you're in high school. And, and so we didn't go to as much college basketball together for, for a little while. And then my dad got into the America East Conference. America East basketball, it's very small time in the grand landscape of the college basketball scene. It is tiny, tiny programs. It is kids playing in front of empty seats. They're not playing on national TV. They're not household names. Well, we're not recruiting the McDonald's All-American uh, or the top 50 player nationally. I think the elite programs in the country, uh, they can hand pick. Uh, who they recruit. UNC, Duke, these are the schools that recruit, you know, the, the best high school like players in the country. You know, the America East kids are the guys who've gone overlooked. There's, you know, maybe they're a little shorter, they're not as athletic. We are a one bid conference, uh, so it really comes down to our conference tournament, and one team each year has the opportunity to represent the America East Conference in the NCAA tournament. Usually the team that comes out of it is a 15 seed or a 16 seed and they get annihilated in the first round of the NCAA tournament every year. These are the underdogs. These are the, the, the Davids of the world, definitely. Except they're like the Davids without a slingshot. <laughs> I think at first I was like, what is this rinky dink? And then when the guys started playing, I loved it because of how hard they were playing and it was actually a really good level of basketball. And they're guys that that you could relate to more. I mean, how many of us are really the haves, you know, growing up versus the have nots. So, you know, you could relate to these to these kids that were, you know, undersized and under recruited and yeah. So around my senior year, my dad and my brother started going to these America East games. And then they got tickets to the uh, America East tournament was that year, my senior year of high school, the 2002 America East tournament. And so I went to them to, to the six games that weekend. It was the first weekend in March. Um, yeah, and I just, that was where I kind of fell in love with, with it. And it was a really great experience too, you know. It was my senior year. I didn't quite know where I was going to school yet. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And, and I knew things were going to change. And, and it was just, it was great to, to, to reconnect with that experience of doing something with my dad and with my brother was really cool. November 18th, 2003. My dad was riding his bike into work in Cambridge. He got hit by a van. Got a call from the hospital, my mom answered it and was like, we have to go get your brother. Your dad was in a car accident or he got hit by a car. We don't know, don't know much what happened. By the time we got there, he'd been out of surgery. You know, he was really up. Uh, just looking at him, his face was so swollen. He didn't look like my dad. And, you know, they really couldn't tell us what was gonna happen or not. Um, you know, uh, they, they gave us, you know, he's got bleeding in the brain. We The rundown of, he really don't know. It kind of takes a while to see how do these things does it drain? Is there bruising? What's the impact of that? So, but I had these tickets that my dad and my brother and myself were supposed to go to this opening game. And um, my brother wasn't up for going. I don't know, he, for, for me it was like I didn't wanna, I just like needed to like not talk about it and not be around the America East and you know, things that were like, big reminders of, of our dad and for him it was like the exact opposite so I guess maybe like that had to do with it. And it was a really unbelievable game for and my one that my dad really would have appreciated and I remember I went back to the hospital after the game to Leahy Clinic and I just talked to my dad about it you know he wasn't 
he wasn't really there. Uh, he never regained really consciousness, like he'd kind of come in and out, but he wasn't there. And that was really tough for a while to see him feeding tube in, breathing tube in. Um, and all during that time when he was in the hospital, basically in and out of a coma, I kept going to games because I didn't know what else to do. My brother didn't really have it in him to go to many games that year. He went to two games with me that year. I thought that it was kind of strange um, that he was like so invested in the America East. He'd always want to talk to me about it when he, you know, when he went to college after, when he moved out and I was still in high school. Whenever he'd come around, he'd always want to talk like about the America East and I'd be like, I don't, you know, I don't really, I'm not that interested. I'm like, got my own high school stuff going on. And I guess maybe it was just, you know, our own ways of dealing with like grief. But my friend Matt kept going with me and I'd pick up other friends along the way. My friend Aiden would come to some of them, but Matt went to like almost every game with me. And I think it's because he knew I was going alone if he wasn't coming with me. I, I knew that him and his father and his brother had, had really started to build, you know, a, a, a stronger even relationship around basketball. And, and I know Jack had taken them to games growing up and that had always been a thing that, that you know, was really a, a big piece of their relationship. And I just felt like, you know, it seemed like something that Sam was, was really connected to and was interesting and, and interested in kind of continuing that connection. So when he asked me to go to, you know, the first game, there was, there was never, a doubt in my mind, like, obviously that's what I would do, you know, because that's that's what I need. I, I can say for 100% certainty if the roles were reversed, I knew he would have done the exact same thing, you know, so it was just like, yeah, absolutely, you know, it's not, I'll be there. You know, I always thought back on my dad used to always joke around with me because we started, we started watching The Simpsons together and he used to always say, you know, like, if I ever become Grandpa Simpson, I want you to take me out into a field and shoot me because I don't want to live life like that. So it always stayed in the back of my mind. He wouldn't have wanted to be a vegetable and um, January 4th, we took him off life support um, and then he was gone. And I really didn't know what to do. And it was just like, you feel like you're in a cloud just walking around. Um, and uh, I just kept going to those games. I didn't know what else to do. That was the one place where things made sense is I kept going to BU games and Northeastern games. and. I'd hop in my car and I'd drive to some other games like Hartford, University of New Hampshire. Going to these basketball games as a fan was really fun uh, because that was when I felt the closest to him. I graduated undergrad in 2007. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had a degree in English. And then I met this kid named Matt Whitrock for who was a student at BU and he wrote for the BU student paper. And we were just talking and somehow the idea came out, you know what, we should launch a website cover in this league because we're both really into the like narrative aspect of it. And then One Bid Wonders was born and uh, I was able to get in there and learn these kids stories and start telling these stories that were not told by anyone else because the papers weren't covering them. A lot of people don't want to commit to covering a low major or mid-major uh, Division I conference, and he did it for a long time, and he did it on his own dime. I must have killed five cars covering those games, just driven them into the crown. And we would, you know, yell at him and heckle him from the stands and, you know, give him crap and talk about his suit and his tie. One Bit Wonders was my connection to my dad going through my fingertips out there onto the, the World Wide Web. And then the, the summer of 2014, we got investors. But then when they invested, it was able to like convince myself like, no, hey, now it's, now it's a job. So, and how are you gonna have more, what job are you gonna have more fun at than this? But once there was a paycheck involved, it, it that passion really went. I was writing an insane amount. The month of January, I wrote 32 feature stories in one month. That is absurd. Like we're talking 32 well-researched, interviewed, like going in depth, writing 2,000, 3,000, 3,500 words for each of these stories. No one does that. No one anywhere writes that much. Sports Illustrated, you're doing like one a month, like at the pinnacle of sports journalism. You're not doing 32 of those. 
And the viewership started growing, but it was like it was never enough. I wasn't sleeping. Uh, my health was deteriorating and it just was getting to be too much. And I was just like, you know what? This is not, I think this is the end because it's making me not love the thing that I've loved for so long. Uh, and I started to not feel them as much at those games. I would definitely say there was a sense of sadness in the sense that it was something he put so much of himself into for so long. But I also do think that there was a sense of relief in the sense that he was like, it was freeing for him to be able to get away from, I guess, chasing the ghost of our, our dad. And then the site wound down and came to an end. And so August 2015, yeah, was when it was officially done. I don't think I was looking for closure. I don't think I ever thought that I was gonna get closure. Uh, someone once told me that it's not like, you don't even learn to live with it, you just kind of start living with it. I don't know how to explain all the years that I was following the league. It started off before I was even writing, before One Bit Wonders was even an idea in my head. But it was just kind of like, the only thing I could describe it is like in Forrest Gump, when he just starts running across the country to just kind of like, put the past behind him or or just make peace with it or whatever. Maybe that's what it was for me, was all that time I spent there was helping me to start to move forward again in life. And I started to. And I feel like that last year of it, I stopped moving forward again because I started worrying so much about everything else associated with it, bills and paycheck and views and investors and all this stuff and uh, and so it just it went from really helping me to keep moving forward to then it started hindering me that last year you know that first year after one bid wonders I didn't go to any college basketball games any America East games I didn't really watch the NCAA tournament and then this year I went back and I started to feel calmer and feel better and and start to feel those old emotions again which was cool and I am a uh, special ed teacher. I'm an elementary school special ed teacher, and I love it. This is, I found my new passion. In that last year where you weren't feeling him anymore, were you worried that you lost him? A Little bit. I mean, like, it was like, how do I get reconnected with him again? Yeah. Have you? I've, I've reconnected with my dad. I have my son now. He's eight months old. He's named Jack. And, uh, I feel my dad when I'm with my son and I'm trying to be a good dad and I'm trying to remember how my dad was as a father and I don't, I don't know if I'll ever be on his level as a dad, but, um, but if I can be, you know, a quarter of the dad that he was, I'll be doing a pretty good job. So I feel him more with my son, yeah. I can see the way it ooh. I can see the way it ooh. Heart so young, so big Then the sentence strikes it down Then the sentence strikes it down